Greetings, welcome to the studio. Thank you for joining me this evening in this evening's live stream. I'm delighted to introduce Josie, um, Josie Purcell, who will be talking about her practice, her art practice. She's a photographer. She recently gained her MA um, and she'll be telling us more about that. And uh, the talk is called Alternative and Sustainable Photography. So, before we make a start, could you please just tell us where you're logging in from? That would be absolutely brilliant to know what country, what town you're viewing the live stream from. That would be really, really useful for us. Um, please, um, I encourage you um, to, to log in to your Facebook or your YouTube account in order that you can actually use the chat, the live text, live chat facility. That way we get feedback and you are, you're able to actually ask questions and comment. Um, we love you to actually ask questions and comment. We really do. So please log in. That's absolutely great. Um, Ingrid, hello Ingrid. Hello from Sweden. Well, hello there, Ingrid. Thank you for being here. Thank you for joining us. Cool. Um, before we make a start, uh, I'll just make a couple of announcements. Um, I'll share my screen. And uh, next week, uh, in conversation, we'll have Stuart Miller, photographer, and he'll be giving a talk on shooting the streets with a Rolleiflex TLR through the lens reflex, twin lens reflex. Uh, that's a rather old camera and it rather takes quite a skill to actually shoot um, street images, street photography with that type of camera. Um, it's really interesting. His work is, 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 is quite amazing. There you have one of his, his recent images, which is absolutely great. Um, we'll, we'll be on at the usual time, 8 p.m. and now it's 8 p.m. UK BST, British Summer Time. Yay! At last! We're here. We deserve it. We deserve a break. And that will be perfect for going out and taking lots of photographs, taking the camera out for walkies and the tripod, nothing better than that. Um, in addition, uh, as you know, I give uh, landscape uh, photography workshops, they're bespoke workshops tailored to customers' needs, and uh, we go to areas of outstanding natural beauty and national parks in Cornwall and Devon. Um, and we spend a whole day, at least eight hours, exploring this amazing, amazing landscape, both inland and along the coast. Um, so we'll take a, 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 a kind of off the beaten track approach. We'll go down country lanes and um, we'll basically go where, 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 where modernity hasn't had its horrid influence. So yeah, so we'll be exploring the landscape. There are two types of, um, of packages that I offer. They're the workshops, the day-long uh, day affairs, and they uh, cover places across Cornwall and Devon, places like Tintagel, Bodmin Moor, um, and, 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 and other places. We're also giving archaeology and photography workshops on Bodmin Moor, looking at ancient sites, Neolithic and Bronze Age sites, and they start in um, May, July and September. So do have a look at those, please. And also I run holiday courses, and these are anything between one and three day long affairs, also in areas of outstanding natural beauty. You'll be staying in hotels, three and four stars, and you can get all the information on the website. And please feel free, if you need any information, please feel free to get in touch with me. So no trouble at all. Okay, without further ado, I'm delighted to introduce this evening's guest, Josie Purcell. Josie, welcome to the show. Hello, Harry, and hello anyone who's listening in. It's lovely to be here. Thank you for the invite. No trouble at all. Thank you for, 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 for accepting the invitation. Um, I'm really looking forward to, to tonight's um, live stream conversation with you because I think what, what you're doing is quite is, is innovative. It really captures the zeitgeist of the time. And I love the images. 
And I, I'll say this, I love and I'm intrigued by the images that you produce because they're not straightforward photography. They're using other methods. And this is what, uh, what I'd love to know more about uh, this evening. And also um, our guests, definitely. I know this is a great opportunity to actually ask questions um, and ask questions as we go along and we'll weave them into the conversation. We're not going to take questions at the end, but we'll actually take questions as we go along. Before we make a make a start, a couple of comments. Um, Hannah, hello from Edinburgh, Scotland. Wonderful. Thank you for being here, Anna. That's absolutely great. And Claire, Claire Louise. Hello from Somerset. Hello, Claire. Thank you for being here. That's absolutely brilliant. Cool. OK, Josie, over to you. How did you how did you start with being what, what what drove you towards um, being aware of the environment of dovetailing that to your practice um i mean i think the awareness of, of the environment and nature and the natural world has, has always been there in the sense of um i grew up in north wales and um you know sort of at the time it was a quite a rural area and Sort of, you know, that sort of childhood um, option of being able to get out and go down to the river and all of that sort of thing. Um, but for me, it was very much around, uh, as a teenager, having this sense of, of and having sort of developing almost this political viewpoint on certain topics. I was very much into animal welfare and it sort of all sort of mingled together a little bit. Um, but it was probably more as a, as a sort of a, an adult that I really started to look into environmental issues. And there was, um, I'll touch on it briefly when we chat through things. Um, but a, a short period of time where we, I helped set up and run a branch of Greenpeace and got involved with some of the protest work through that. Mm -hmm. um, so that was sort of one of the, I guess, foundation stones of my interest in, in, in environmental matters. Excellent. That's great. Let me just, I've got another, we've got another comment from Marion. Hi, from Princeton, New Jersey. Well, wow. wow. From the other <laughs> side of the pond. Welcome, Marion. Thank you for being here. Thank you for joining us. Cool. So, Josie, shall we move over to the slides? Absolutely. Yes, yes. And I'm going to use a few notes just so I don't go off rambling for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> a bit of rambling is fine. Why not? Eh? <laughs> OK, Excellent. just tell me when to move on, the, on, on to the next okay. slide and uh, that'll be fine. Brilliant. So next slide, please. OK, um, so this is just a little bit about me. Um, obviously, I'm going to talk more about alternative and um, sustainable photographic uh, matters. Um, but my practice is also about how we sustain ourselves um, to be able to actually have a photographic practice. Um, and also, it's about the fact that as a photographic artist or a professional photographer, you have to be much more than someone who simply takes the photograph and Harry I'm sure you'll appreciate this as well um, you need a variety of skills <laughs> um, the list here um, is probably sort of um, not how I see myself but the mix of all the different skills that I bring to my practice so uh, yes the photographic art my my love for that for creating um, I sort of try and refer to it as a realistic environmentalist um, and trying sort of working within the compromises we often have to make um, between our society as it is and making sure the environment and nature is, is well cared for and can continue to support us. Um, I've also got my podcast. Um, I'm a journalist and I make short films and I'm a communications and marketing manager with an environmental charity as well. So there's a huge mix of... of um, different skills that I think it's important for photographers um, or people wanting to perhaps get into photography to realise that you know it, it can take a lot more than than just 
loving taking a photograph if you want to perhaps sort of do it as a as a living. Um, so yes, yeah, so next slide, please. Mm -hmm. So this one, short and sweet, um, but it's sort of how I see myself. Um, and so the next slide, Harry, please. And it might not be quite what you're thinking. Um, so I refer to myself maybe as a magpie photographer. Um, they are one of my favorite birds, by the way. Um, I know some people aren't so keen, but they are one of mine. Um, and it's really about sort of how I align myself to the way that they are curious um they are um will seize an opportunity um and also i think i'm quite intrigued by shiny things so i do have a tendency to go oh what's that over there oh what's that over there so it's those sort of things and how i associate myself um to magpies but i know that some bdi people perhaps looking will go well that cyanotype we have there is a Cornish chop so yes it is it's not a magpie you are right um but can I have the next slide please Harry yeah of course can I also say magpies they're highly social <laughs> they cooperate and they're very intelligent and they're quick <laughs> <laughs> well I'll, I'll take three of those four <laughs> I'll let you decide which three out of four <laughs> um so this, this image is actually sort of going back to the beginning for me in a sense, um, because um, the Falkland happened when I was a young, you know, sort of 11, I think 11 or 12-ish. Um, and I remember being outside and a, and a plane, a really loud plane flying low over the outhouse. Um, and I, and sort of having this memory of thinking, oh gosh, it, is, is this it? And and I think that sort of moment possibly was maybe the start of my young sort of political mindset and way of seeing one of the ways of seeing the world and what happens in, in the world. Um, and it really sort of uh, planted this desire to, in some way, try and share the futility of war. And I know lots of people have done it before and we are still trying to do it now, but it, it was definitely... Um, planted that seed um, how could I you know what could I do to to sort of share this look at look at war whatever side you're on just look at it and it, 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 yeah where do we get with it most of the time um, but uh, at the same time I have this recollection in my school of there being a dark room and I I remember, and I'm not sure if it's my memory chain playing tricks because it's a few, a few years since school, um, but I remember it being intrigued by this locked dark room um, and it was never used. Um, and I went to a careers advice session and I remember saying to them that I wanted to be a war photographer. I didn't really know an awful lot about photography back then. Um, I'd used the family Polaroid and that was probably pretty much it. Um, but yeah, I'd, I've been really fascinated by this. And But when I said that's what I wanted to do as a career, I was told, like, no, just go and get yourself a proper job. Um, so next slide, please. <laughs> so, yes, yeah, so I went basically then off to, off to college, went to art college in, instead. Um, and it was a great place to experiment. It was a great place to discover how photography had actually captured my heart and it was photography that really spoke to me sort of uh, my creative side um i even had my first experience of uh, medical photography at my first college as well um so yeah it, it was a really good grounding um and i actually chose uh advertising photography to focus on but i always feared towards using natural materials in my work so um it was all pre-digital too. So mostly on five by four cameras or square format uh, film and in traditional processing dark rooms. Um, so you can see from these images, you know, sort of this, this interest in using uh, fruit and flowers. It, it tended to be um, influenced in that way or food related. <laughs> Next slide, please. So yes, so um, I left my second college um, early. I'd actually phoned up a photographer um, near where I lived in North Wales at the time. 
and um, got, was taken on as an assistant. So I really got a really good grounding working for a um, commercial photographer um, from set building to jewellery, um, on location, um, darkroom work. So yeah, really, really varied, varied um, experience. Um, I then went on to work for St. Bart's Hospital as a medical photographer and to work in a studio portrait, um, uh, sorry, a portrait studio <laughs> um, as well. But I found that, that I'd lost sort of um, my personal photography and my personal sort of love of photography by my late 20s. Um, so next slide, please. Ah, so yes, yeah, so we went to um, so this sort of time, early 30s, um, I actually, we moved to the southeast for my husband's job. He he had, he got a job working as an elephant keeper caring for rescued circus elephants. And I went back to med medical photography at the time. And I will say that um, if anyone is interested in medical photography, it is a fascinating job. Um, and uh, ophthalmic photography, looking at the inside of the eyes is not only fascinating, it's also quite beautiful. Um, but after that stint, we decided we, we wanted to return to the Southwest area. And this is where I then eventually um, retrained as a journalist. And um, it was after a stint in the sales department um, that I sort of want, I knew I wanted to return somehow to my photographic background. And the editor at the paper at the time very kindly um, gave me a couple of test assignments and then took me on as a, a trainee. And I gained my um, NCTJ um, qualifications and spent, I think it was about 12 years then with the local papers, first um, running a six page business section and then moving into the newsroom. But um, Harry, if I could have the next slide, please. There was this little niggle that actually wouldn't go away um, about photography specifically, and that led me to setting up Shutterpod. So this is my community-minded, eco-conscious photographic, I like to call it my sunroom rather than dark room, or maybe an eco-dark room. Um, and that's where I worked with service providers um, within social services and schools and individuals. Um, so sorry, next uh, slide, please. And to actually set up Shutterpod, um, I successfully crowdfunded to raise the money so that I could get some darkroom equipment and some of the basics to actually get started with that. Um, and I actually secured over 1,300 through crowdfunding. And that really sort of set the set Shutterpod um, in motion. And um, so next slide, please, Harry. And in the very early days of Shutterpod, I also created um, this one day, um, I cheekily call it a photo festival. It was only one day and it was part of the New Key Art 8 Festival at the time. But that was bringing together some other photographers, um, upcycling some cameras. Um, we had a photo talk. I um, took people down to the beach to create cyanotypes. So... Um, that was where I really started to um, yeah, work with individuals and work with, with different groups. Um, so next slide, please, Harry. And while I was also doing, running Shutterpod, just as an aside and possibly part of my magpie nature, um, I'd also um, changed roles and I'd met a gentleman who was a trustee for the Craft Association and was very fortunate to be commissioned um, by him for, to create two films with the NHS. So this all is happening at the same time, as well as working and doing Shutterpod and, and sort of making these films. Um, sorry, next slide, please, Harry. But I really wanted to concentrate on the alternative processes, um, such as cyanotype, anthotype, um, and what I refer to as non-fixed lumen printing. So that's when you don't use um, the photographic chemicals, but you scan images um, once you've created them. And we can always talk about that more if we need to. Um, and it's around sort of using techniques that mix analog and digital 
um, and marrying up and compromising between those. Um, so as Shutterpod grew, it was my love to sort of connect photography with nature that also grew. Um, I mentioned before that I'd set up um, and uh, run a branch of Greenpeace. Um, and although when we moved back to Cornwall, I didn't carry on with that, um, it's something that was always there. And this interest in environmental matters hadn't gone away. And I, I just felt there was something still missing from my work. And I think some people might perhaps refer to that as their um, photographic voice. So I felt that was still sort of maybe not not quite there for me personally. And um, so next slide, please, Harry. Um, and that's when um, serendipity, let's call it that, but um, it sort of aligned that at the time I was feeling like this and thinking this way, Falmouth University started their first online um, MA courses, and that was back in 2016. Um, and I feel like it's where I very sort of I finally cemented what I would what, what I call my photographic calling through through the process of the MA. Um, so yes, next slide, please, Harry. Um, so the MA experience really led to the spark for my final major project, which is um, you know I've worked on since um, an ongoing series, Harina Now. And this is where I'm taking a more subtle approach to environmental issues. Um, it's not about using docu documentary style images um, and it doesn't depict the real. Um, so you don't see humans within the images. You don't see um, the, the real life uh, human environmental um, situations. And instead, I concentrated on marrying up the lumen process of so taking black and white expired photographic um, paper and making abstract images um, along the beach, along the shoreline, um, using sand, sea water and the sun. Um, but marrying that up then with, with um, post digital techniques. So, yes, please. Next slide, Harry. Thank you. So these are some more of the images from Harina now, and the sort of the motivation around this is is twofold. So one, it is about raising the profile of of what is possibly a, still a lesser known environmental issue, um, but it's one that has been having and is having dire consequences, not just on the ecosystems it can impact, but on human life too. Um, and secondly, it is about this. Um, response that we have to human va uh, human made environmental problems by using um, abstract imagery and investigating if that type of aesthetic can actually prompt action um, is it if someone sees my work and is drawn to it if they then go on to find out more will it inspire them to learn more about the topic or take some action share it with someone else you know all of those things um, so yeah, so some experts have predicted that we could potentially actually uh, run out of sand because of the demand for it in um, construction, beach renourishment, lots of other issues. Um, seems completely impossible for such a ubiquitous material. Um, but it also seems quite unimaginable that the demand for sand has led to people um, losing their homes and their livelihoods, but also their lives. Um, so next slide, please, Harry. Um, so it's really about um, sparking conversations and doing it in a way um, that that uses a different format um, than perhaps showing the, the the true life or the reality of of, of the issue. And um, sand is used in so many things that we rely on, um, from you know things like toothpaste to our our computers to our you know the, our smartphones. Um, it's in it's in so many our cameras. You know the things that we use um, we use it for. Um, so it sort of started to make me think more about how photography itself also can be more sustainable, which I think is a big ask, but certainly worth 
um, investigating. Um, so yes, yeah, so so next uh, slide, please, Ali. Um, so I'll run through just a few other commissions. So you've got a little bit of taste of, of, of my background as well. So this one was 6,000 flowers. Um, and I was very fortunate that I've been commissioned to um, respond to uh, several photographic projects. And this one, 6,000 flowers, it was made in response to um, Farm for AON Beans Pollinators Project. Um, between the Cornwall Area of Outstanding Natural Beauty and the Environment and Sustainability Institute at the University of Exeter. I wanted to choose cyanotype, but particularly anthotype as, as in particular for this project. So um, next slide, please, Harry. Um, and the Farm for AOMB's project, um, it was seeking to make a difference to the quality of our of landscapes for conservation, but also for food production. And um, at the core of it, there was a computer programme developed by um, Professor Juliet Osborne's team, a pollinators research group at the ESI, that replicates the foraging and colony survival of bees in um, realistic landscapes. And they worked with five um, farms across the AOMB, Cornwall AOMB landscape. Um, and my work tried to draw on the science behind it and the importance of how it helps us understand more about bee health, their survival and the pollination they provide, but then obviously how that supports our health as well. Um, so next slide, please, Harry. Um, so I wanted to use the anthotype in particular. If you're not sure about what anthotype is, it's a process that simply uses the the juice so, or, or the you know sort of the the, the liquid from um, flowers, berries, leaves, and um, it can be you know numerous sort of natural sources, and um, it uses that to create images. You can't fix it like you can um, other photographic processes, but that's it in a nutshell. And I wanted to use it to show that. Even you know, using a photosensitive emulsion such as this, the images that are normally very delicate, they can take several hours or weeks to 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 expose, um, but they will fade away um, unless you care for them incredibly well, um, or you scan them and keep them that way. So you you can't really just hang them up on a wall and hope they'll be there forever. So it was that sort of metaphor, I guess, for for bees' health and our own health. Um, so next slide, please, Harry. Um, and that's just really a couple of comments from the lovely people I, I worked with on the project. Um, but for me, I think it's really wonderful to work across disciplines. Um, I'm not a scientist and I don't pretend to know everything that they are perhaps talking about. Um, um, but it's fascinating and it really sort of opens dialogues. Um, it provides inspiration for my work as well. Um, so yeah, working with the scientific community and marrying up art and science, I think is, is just something that I personally really love to do. Um, and also with this one, it when you're trying to think about ways to minimize your own photographic footprint, it, 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 sort of, it helps with that thinking process um, what can I do perhaps? What could I do differently? Um, so next slide, please, Harry. And this led then to Catalyst, which was actually um, a virtual show and it was through the ESI and they created an online exhibition that celebrated nearly 10 years of them working with myriad artists of different styles and techniques. Um, and uh, I took part with two of the Harina Now images um, because they wanted to showcase new work and um, following, you know, where you've gone on to following your your involvement with them. And um, one of my images from my latest project, part of the patchwork, which we can talk about shortly. So yes, next next image, uh, next slide, please. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Reflect Viewed. This is a, a lovely project again to work on. Another commission that was with Sound Art and the University of Exeter. Um, they put on a weekend of sound, light um, and art, trying to bring local communities together, um, regional and international artists. Um, and it was to really try and explore sort of 
coastal living and um, well-being. Um, and we had to create, there was three artists that, that were chosen to create um, installations, outside installations. Um, and it's really interesting to see what everyone else did as well. So do try and look that up if you can. Um, but I chose this piece of work, Intertidal Blue, where I created cyanotype again, using images of the um, sea pool and also the sand and seawater um, from the area. Um, but it was one of the projects where I felt a little bit perhaps more compromised because it was needed to be outside. So the artwork needed to be, um, you know, sort of this vision I had that it would be somewhere that people could sit on the bench and look out at the ocean um, and have these comfy cushions. So there was a little bit sort of compromise around, well, they'll also need to be waterproof and what materials can I use to create them um, that perhaps aren't going to just be sort of um, plastic based and and uh, you know and also the good news is these cushions are still going and I think that's about oh, three years four years later but anyway yeah they're still going um so next slide please um so of us for us um this I mean as reflect viewed had been about more mental health and well-being and being immersed in the outdoors um this one um, was actually about, uh, it was part of an international conference and how we can actually look to sustain, uh, to mine more sustainably. Um, so sustainable mining, um, what are the possibilities for, for, for that? How can we, yeah, how can we get what we need um, uh, from natural resources, but do that perhaps in, in better ways? more considered manners. Um, when I'd actually created my Harina Now work, I'd spoken to a geologist friend who'd said that they had a bit of a cathodoluminescence quality, and I never heard of, of that word before. Um, but apparently it is a, um, a geological sampling technique, and it seemed the sort of perfect um, basis for this, for this commission. Um, it related to the earth and it can be used to, and I'm going to quote here, so bear with me, it can be used to study trace element chemistry and geochemical effects, um, which enables you to reconstruct geological processes. Um, it can reveal internal structures that might not be detectable via other techniques um, to determine the composition, growth and provenance of minerals. So um, it seemed like it, it, it made sense in my head in the, like the sort of initial thought processes. Um, and the end results, I saw some images, the sort of a, a waveform array that can be sometimes seen this, in this technique. And it reminded me of sort of almost of kaleidoscopes as well. So I wanted to draw on this collective love that people can have. Um, uh, around kaleidoscopes. So next slide, please, Harry. Um, so hopefully from that, you start to get the, the idea of, of this kaleidoscope um, sense. Um, and I, I think if you actually do the next one as well, Harry. That's it, so lovely. Um, so yes, yeah, so it was, it was created again using this non-fixed lumen and digital processes, but it combines negatives from this cathodoluminescence um, images and sand and earth. Um, and it was sort of thinking around, even in the face of really cha challenging environmental matters, um, how humans can sustain their lives and their comfort um, that many you know people enjoy now. Um, with resources that are potentially finite or harder to access um, and how we can perhaps use a sense of joy um, um, through the kaleidoscopes, through the colours, through the, through the images to start those conversations. And um, so next slide, please. Um, and so these are just some of the original um, images of, of the of the minerals uh, as seen through the the microscopes for, for these these catholuminescence images that are created um, and next slide please and I worked with a um, kaleidoscope maker 
I did try and make a few of my own, but nothing as amazing, no, nowhere near amazing as um, the kaleidoscope maker. I wanted something that would look at the, um, that would go with the 2D images at the exhibition um, that, that would be tactile and people could pick up um, and look through um, to really sort of spark those 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 sort of thought processes. And um, those are sort of images that you can see sort of, I actually took really small um, prints of the larger images and used them as the sort of the, the gems within the kaleidoscope. Um, and you can see one of the scientists there that I worked with actually looking through um, the, the kaleidoscope. Um, so next slide, please. Um, and the culmination of this conference and exhibition was actually a book by the, the scientists and the curators involved. Um, the aim of the book um, was to start this debate around human interactions with the earth um, as our consumption and um, resources grow um, ever larger, like, sorry, consumption of our resources grows ever la larger. Um, and it sort of considers place, it considers time, it considers nature and culture, um, while actually looking at our relationships to mining. Um, it's Waterstone's description actually states, through dialogue and debate, perhaps we may unearth mechanisms to carve out a more sustainable relationship with the earth while maintaining access to the resources that will support the global population. Um, so next slide, please. So this one is actually my series called Moon in a Silver Bag. Um, it will make sense, even though the actual project was called Watching the Sun. Um, and that was my uh, a residency with Maze Creative. Hopefully some of you have heard of it. I'm sure I think Harry's been involved with, with Maze Creative. Um, but it was part of their Measuring the Universe uh, project, and that explored historical connections between people and the sun. And it focused on the role played by Cornish astronomers. Um, it was a mix of astronomy specialists, um, ar archaeoastronomers, uh, and astrophysicists along time, alongside a number of multidisciplinary artists who all in some way were connected by their practice to the theme of, of looking up and, and thinking about the universe. Um, and I was intrigued by one of the talks relating back to myths and folklore um, and how those myths and folklore um, often relate to the planets, the sun, the moon and stars. And that matches my other interest in the sort of magic of storytelling um, and how this can unfold through time and societies. Now, as part of this series, I decided to actually take, um, <coughs> excuse me, names for the moon from an almanac, um, and I'm creating cyanotypes um, with mixed illustrations. So I'm trying to start using illustrations um, and marking, pen marking within the work. Um, so, so yes, yeah, so that was a, a, a sort of, a, you know, sort of looking down at the earth, it was looking up. Um, and it also sort of plays into my sort of uh, concern maybe about um, the, the, the sort of space debris that we're creating now as, as well. So that's another thing to think about. Um, we've got a lot of things to think about, haven't we, us humans? Um, next slide, please. So I mentioned part of the patchwork earlier, um, and this is a personal project um, that I started only, what year are we now? 2020. So really when, when um, the pandemic hit, um, I was very fortunate to um, actually get an allotment space. I've now got two allotment spaces and they really, really valuable to me and, and my, you know, my husband and so many people up there, fellow um, allotmenteers. Um, but this idea, this part of the patchwork idea actually came about when I was thinking about this, this word allotment and being allotted space. Um, I'm very passionate about the, the right to roam and access to land. Um, and I don't mean that as in how, being able to go tromping through people's gar back gardens willy nilly, but um, for instance, you know, in England, the 
it, it's it's a very limited amount of space that we can legally um, before trespass etc cetera, etc cetera, it um, starts to, to to play a part um, so that this sort of idea this part of the patchwork was really around how we how land is allocated and how we allocate space to ourselves um, so I wanted to use portraits of, of allotmenteers and get them involved and and take actual, which is, you know, not my usual way of working, but actually start taking portraits of the people, but marrying that up with um, alternative process images that will be made from something within the allotment that, that means something to them about the earth um, that they're, they're using to, to, you know, to grow food, um, et cetera. So it's sort of around using black and white film um to make these portraits and the idea at the moment because it's still a newish project that it will either they'll either be printed and um using answer type or hand printed using answer type or possibly processed and or processed using a vegetable based developer like mint or possibly seaweed developer so those are all sort of ideas um and hopefully this is something that I want to um, develop um, into, a, into a photo book. I'm very conscious, I'm rattling on here and it's almost 20 to nine. And some of you who are in the UK might be wanting to get off to watch um, Peaky Blinders at nine, so I'll crack on. Um, so next image, please. So everything else, um, along with these personal projects and commissions, I also do my best to try and get involved in other photography um events so member of shutter hub um i've taken part in online um uh exhibitions in material reclaim photography festival i continue to run um workshops through shutter pod mostly with school schools and through education now um i still work full time so that certainly keeps me busy um but there was something that i still wanted to do around this environmental element. Um, uh, I've always had this dream to create a, a physical virtual photographic space in Cornwall to bring um, photographers together who are actually working to raise the profile of environmental um, matters and humanita connected humanitarian issues. And I guess Shutterpod was the precursor for that. But during lockdown, I began to formalize my idea more and started my research. Um, by creating my eco-conscious photography podcast, Photopocene. So next slide, please, Harry. So Photopocene really, um, one, it's a play on the word Anthropocene. Um, and it's a time when I feel photography is having and has had a significant impact on the world we live. Um, so through this podcast, I chat with other photographers who are passionate about using their talents to raise awareness of environmental issues or who are actually already using or devising sustainable photographic practices. Um, so the sort of tagline, it's, it's all about sharing eco-conscious photography in an audio way. So next slide, please, Harry. And I've been incredibly humbled by the response to this pad podcast um, and the generosity and spirit uh, with which anyone taking part um, you know to share their work and their motivations behind their work um my i think since since we starting in april last year there's now 26 episodes um and so next slide please um so you can see here um i'll just quickly mention a few people i won't mention all 26 they're all amazing please go and listen if you can um but the first one, Mina, a Finnish visual artist, she lives in France. She sort of she shares stories about her relationship with the natural world um, and how nature is our essence of being. So next slide, please. And this is uh, Steg Marlon Weston. Um, we discussed his cameraless images um, created in nature within jungles, forests and mountains. Um, so next slide, please, Harry. And this is Sarah Garrard, um, a great chat with Sarah, found out we are both quite fascinated by mermaids um, and as well as a photographer and artist specialising in darkroom 
printing, portraiture and experimental photography. She's also a committed environmentalist. Um, next slide, please, Harry. And this is um, Ilya, also based in, in Cornwall. Um, she covers many XR events, but her work primarily um, weaves around climate change and social injustice. Um, and she marries written word into a photographic work, and it's beautiful. And she does actually have a show on at the moment at Truro Cathedral in Cornwall. So if you can get there, please do. Um, and next slide, please. And Nettie Edwards. Um, it was really wonderful to speak to Nettie um, about her creativity and passion for nature. And um, I was very honoured she spoke very candidly about her personal mental health experience as a catalyst for a connection to digital, historic and analogue techniques and her subsequent adoration for type in particular. Um, so next slide, please. So yeah, it's been an absolute um, privilege to meet these people um, over the airwaves uh, and they're all incredibly talented. I mean, not only do I learn so much from them, it's really wonderful to see this growing interest in how we can use photography um, more sustainably too. Um, so next slide, please, Harry. Um, and I think with that word um, sustainability, it can be quite easily um, thrown around or perhaps used. And there's a lot of different dictionary definitions and it tends to mean um, being able to continue over a period of time. And if you Google sustainable photography, um, you'll get a plethora of suggestions and different viewpoints. But for me, um, the bottom line is always having in your photographic mindset a consideration um, of your impact, your photographic impact on, on natural resources. And are there other ways to get to the end result, which may take less resources? Um, but it's about finding out where you're comfortable. Um, if you're creating work around negative um, environmental issues, can you just um, justify the means in making it um, or just simply bearing witness override all other concerns? Um, so next slide, please. Um, and the first person that I interviewed on the Photopocene um, podcast was Hannah Fletcher, and she's um, very much involved in sustainable photography world. Um, and she's also involved with the London Alternative Photography collective um, and the sustainable darkroom and this um, booklet that they've created um, this is still not a solution um, took artists um, brought artists together to sort of who are working in this analog trying to make analog photography more sustainable um, to looking at these themes of recycling removing repurposing or reworking um, and what their relationship is to analog photography in the dark room. Um, and Hannah's, uh, I hope Hannah won't mind me using this, but in her foreword of the, of the zine, she writes, this project is designed to build collective power within and oppose the current photographic industry. I want to encourage and empower you as makers, as thinkers, and as doers to have the knowledge and awareness of the materials and processes you are using, to understand the relationship between things you use and the planet you live on. Um, and I think that's perhaps the fundamental basis for creating a sustainable photographic practice um, and the future of the photographic industry is understanding those relationships between what we use and, and, and where we live. Um, so next slide, please. So this is just a, a few snippets of um, what uh, this, this magpie photographer um, is, is going on to. Um, 100 heroines, if you haven't heard of it, have a look. Um, I'm involved in a project around photography and protest with them at the moment. Um, if you're based in Cornwall and Devon, camp, please look at them. They support artists locally. I've got an exhibition um, uh, coming up in Lyme Regis in July, hopefully um, one with um, Bean Photo Club in Penryn. Um, and of course, there's Photo Buffy, more shut apart. Um, also, um, I've been doing some work with Falmouth University and possibly I've been interviewed for a PhD but you know just a few things and um, so next slide please Harry and that's it so really just to say if you do want to find out more about my 
work um, or if you want to have a chat about any of the topics or go into more detail about what I do then then always happy to chat or just you know maybe get in touch if, if you work in this way and you'd like to be on the podcast but um, yes I hope I haven't sent you all to sleep. <laughs> Not at all fascinating <laughs> presentation wow I think a couple of, 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 of things struck me um, one is your varied background. I think you, 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 you've had many lives and I think that's a very <laughs> enriching experience that obviously feeds into your, into your practice, I'm sure. Um, I think another thing that really caught my attention was the fact that you actually seek or get inspiration, draw inspiration from a number of sources. And I think looking at that intersection between art and science is really interesting because there's a lot of mileage there to be explored that is a rich rich terrain to actually explore that uh, mm. conjunction there is just absolutely fascinating um, folks um, if you have any co comments questions um, now is that now is your time we have uh, we have one comment uh, hello Anne from London hi and <laughs> thank you for joining us excellent all the way from Londinium wonderful <laughs> that's great and um, so how um, how do you see your foot in terms of your pro the the, la the latest project that you're actually working how do you see progression there how do you see it developing so the part of the of the patchwork project the, yes. the allotments and the, yes. yeah i mean i think in my head at the moment and it, it's difficult well, certainly you know early stages i think with photographic projects um i can start with an idea and end up somewhere completely different at the end of it so um at the but at the moment the idea is that this would become um a photo book i've never actually made a photo book so i'd, I'd quite like to, to make a photo book and then again that draws on this constant sort of internal battle and dialogue i have about oh that's creating stuff um, <laughs> um, absolutely yes yes and, and it's yeah. actually looking at different different styles as well because the portraits are very kind of black and white documentary 35 mil i guess um they have that uh, that reportage documentary kind of style with your with yeah. your other images that are that, that that are that are different almost created by by a different mind a different mindset um that actually yeah. works so well together and somehow they, they 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 play off one and another because they they, they relate there's a there's a kind of familial or a crossover there between them that's really interesting yeah. mm, i'd love to see yeah. how that work progresses we have a comment well, hopefully <laughs> yeah sorry go ahead i interrupted you. So, hope, hopefully more no that's okay hopefully more to come on on that one i think that's going to be sort of a one of my a longer term project because i'd like to do it over a few years i think with the with the allotments and build it up and absolutely yeah. so there's a maturity there of the idea and de and yeah. developing the idea and the concept absolutely that's great yeah from um marion <laughs> you've given so much to think about which is wonderful <laughs> but my first reaction is that i need to find out more about the issues regarding sand indeed this is I lost it. This is a tribute to your abstract approach. Indeed. Oh, well, that's really lovely, Marianne. Thank you. And I would say um, one of the people I, I worked um, closely with, um, if you want to find out more about the actual fan, global fan crisis, um, uh, the late uh, woman's name is Kieran Pereira and she runs an organisation called um, sandstories.org so if you google sandstories.org um, then you you can find everything you probably need to know about the global sand crisis through her um, there are lots and lots of others uh, that I could mention but um, <laughs> yeah that's a good starting point. In a nutshell Josie give us a give, give us a preview of what is the sand crisis? Well, I mean, 
I, gosh, um, I, we probably need quite a long, a, quite a long time to, to chat about it. But it's it's obviously, you know, um, particularly around construction, that there's only a certain type of sand. So you can't you can't just pop off to the desert and get a bucket full of sand. You 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 need and certain types of sand um, that have been uh, that can that are suitable for building um, for construction. Um, and so a lot of it can be taken from rivers, um, from riverbeds. Um, so that can then obviously impact on ecosystems, but also the people living along those rivers um, will lose their livelihoods. Um, you, you know, pe- people need to make a living as well. So then you get um, situations where there can be um, what what they refer to as sort of sand mafias. Um, and yeah, it, it affects a number of different places around around the world. Um, so I would definitely recommend, if you really want to find out the, the full details, head to sandstories.org as a good starting point. Absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. Definitely. Sounds fascinating. I mean, Absolutely it's not fascinating. That we, it's not something we necessarily think about, perhaps, um, you know, in the UK or, or other um, countries. But even in the UK, um, there are, you know, there are potential issues around sand use and how it's used. But so, yeah, but, but that could be a whole nother, a whole nother conversation. Yes, absolutely. Or, or, or more than one or we could have a program yeah. on, on just sand. Yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah. Yes, because it's all about the environment on the one hand and limited resources on the other and consumption and the kind of knock on effect or domino effect that it actually has. Um, because this is a process and it has it, it, it is like any process it's a complex process with a number of people involved and uh, how these this this balance or equilibrium hence Gaia <laughs> is, yeah. is is actually affected naturally so yeah and it's all related to mother earth <laughs> that's what it boils <laughs> down to Pachamama yeah. <laughs> I mean, we, we, you know, it, we absolutely do rely on natural resources so much. But at the same time, I think through my photographic work and mm-hmm. the way I work, it's often cameraless. It's not always cameraless work, but I'm just trying to, um, you know, there has been talk in the past of things like compassion fatigue, where people are overwhelmed by what they see. So they switch off, whether that is a true thing or and that does happen. I'm sure a lot of people... And because of the amount of imagery that we might see now. So I guess for me, this is about trying to sort of raise awareness in a more subtle way, but still hopefully like Marianne is doing, people will still go off and, and, and try and find out more for themselves and, and uh, not wanting to quote a supermarket, but every little helps, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, 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 indeed. Folks, any, if you have any comments, questions now is the time because we're rounding up now we've just gone slightly over the hour but that's okay no problem at all that's absolutely fine cool so Josie this has been a fascinating presentation thank you so much for giving us the lowdown on 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 your theme and your your subject and your love for for photography and image making so that is absolutely great cool thank you very much you're very welcome so folks do go to Josie's website what's your website again Josie at josiepurcellphotography.com cool and uh, certainly follow Josie on 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 Instagram if you actually want to get the latest updates and um, by all means have a look at uh, photo per scene um I've listened to a number of those of, 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 of episodes of the podcast there that are really, really good. And listening to podcasts is a great, great way of, of actually engaging. As a matter of fact, um, I've been kindly invited to, to participate um, in the next couple of months. So I'm delighted to, 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 to be a guest. So that'll be great. We have a comment from Ingrid. Thank you so much. To thinking on going much to think on going forward. That's wonderful to hear that, Ingrid. That's really good. Thank you so much. Thank you. Excellent. Cool. Well, and on that note, I'll say goodbye and thank you so much. 
We'll be we'll we'll be in touch, and 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 definitely it would be wonderful if you could come back as 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 a guest and tell us actually um, how you've actually progressed, uh, how your work is developing. Oh, we have one fine one other comment, Dragana. Oh. Very interesting. Thank you, and thank you to Harry for organising this. My pleasure, Dragana. That's excellent. Good mm -hmm. that you're here. Fantastic. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Superb. Cool. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you all for coming and listening. <laughs> and thank uh, you, Harry. Not at all. My pleasure. Cool. <laughs> bye for now. Bye bye. Okay, that was great. That was a that was an amazing, really, really interesting talk, and I think it really puts the it puts the the cat amongst the pigeons because I think really. It, Josie's work captures the zeitgeist of our time. Um, even the name of, 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 of the podcast here is Photopocene, playing on the Anthropocene, this latest um, development in humanity where, where, where the layers where of, of, of the new geology is actually being created by human interaction on the landscape. And it's mainly rubbish, uh, which is rather ironic way to to go but hey ho there you are so next week uh do tune in we've got a, a street photography with 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 stuart so that'll be absolutely great and thank you so much for 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 joining me and 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 and, and our guest and i look forward to seeing you next week you have a good week ahead thank you so much bye for now